Hello, I'm David Petruto, the Drunken Woodworker, and today I have Joshua Driscoll from Los Angeles, California, who is a tax and business lawyer. That's right, David. How you doing? Good. How are you? Thanks for having me on the show. You bet. So let's first talk about who you are, what you do, and uh, just your, your your credentials. Sure. Well, I am uh, licensed in Ohio and California. I practice in business and tax law, and I typically help small businesses, production companies, or other groups uh, run their business and handle their legal affairs from taxes to uh, formations of the business to closing the business down and to protecting their to their assets, including their you know, their work product that they make, just like you. Cool. Now you have your own business, right? I do. Yes, I have my own firm, uh, Permeth and Driscoll. I uh, like I said, help focus on uh, small businesses and work with a good group of people that all work with our clients and help them protect their designs and help them keep their businesses moving. Great. Do you have a website? I do. It's uh, www.primithlaw.com. All right. So we might as well dig another question. Might then. as well go ahead. All right. First question. As content creators, do we need disclaimers in our videos? Can we be held liable if somebody gets injured attempting to do what we show in the videos? Well, that's a very good question. And, you know, typically, uh, and what I'll say, I'll start this out, is that this applies to the states that I'm licensed in, Ohio and California. I'm not licensed to give legal advice in any other state. So use this uh, for information purposes only. And obviously check with a, an attorney in your state if you have questions about how it applies to your situation. But typically, uh, disclaimers and videos are always a good idea. They're never uh, frowned upon. It's, it's more protection than not. But for what I've seen you do, and for probably what most of what your audience does, they're, they're not necessary. As long as you're providing and showing good shop safety, you're not advocating to do something incorrectly, uh, then it's never going to become a problem. Uh, but if you certainly are, are showing somebody how to do something wrong, or your, your videos or your, your podcast would show somebody um, how to operate a saw and, they did, and you were showing them wrong, then of course you may expose yourself to liability, which obviously nobody wants to do. Right. So, you know, you could, it could be a quick two, two sentence thing at the bottom of your, your la, you know, at the end of the video. Uh, it could be something you say at the beginning. Um, you know, I always hearken it or look at it as, you know, HGTV or DIY. They're, they're not full of disclaimers constantly. Yeah. They may say one thing once, you know, or, hey, let's put on our safety glasses. And, okay. You know, that kind of thing. Those types of things are protection for you. And it helps your viewers just keep, uh, you know, shop safety in mind, which is obviously always important. Sure. Now, um, YouTube has it so you can't go back and edit old videos. Do you think, now if I wanted to put a disclaimer in my videos, do you think it's um, okay for me to put it in the description of the videos and, and maybe in the on my website where it's sure. embedded? Sure. I think that would totally be fine. And, okay. you know, obviously you're hoping nobody ever gets hurt. And if they do get hurt, that they don't point the finger at you. Yeah. I think it's a far stretch to say, if, you know, if somebody really hurts themselves, that they did that because of what you're showing them. Gotcha. Um, you know, just advocating good shop safety, I think, is enough. But if you want to put that information on there, I think absolutely what you just said is fine. Putting it on the website, putting it in the show notes or at the bottom of the, of the YouTube page, that's totally fine. All right. Let's move on to the next question. If we sell something we make, can we be sued if the buyer injures themselves with it? If so, what do we need to do to protect ourselves? Yeah, this is a good question. It's a product's liability question, basically. And it's you know the same thing as if you buy something at Walmart or another store and you go home and it, it blows up in your face. Obviously, everybody in the chain of you know custody of that product sometimes has liability. So when you're making products, you need to keep in mind safety of individuals because you absolutely can be held responsible for uh, something causing damage to someone or causing harm. So the right way to handle it, I think, is if you've started to sell products to individuals on a, on a pretty large scale basis, you've expanded outside of your family and your friends, it might be the best idea to get a general liability policy. They're going to be very inexpensive for someone in this situation. And you know, most insurance, uh, insurance agents may even say, okay, well, it doesn't sound like this is going to be very much of a policy. And that's fine because all you want is something very basic that if someone would come after you or get hurt with your product that you're covered okay. in some way. And these policies typically would pay for the cost of defense okay. and they would pay for the damages done to someone. You, you know, in your situation, the type of products you make, you might only need a hundred thousand dollar policy. What really is going to happen to somebody from one of your products, mm -hmm. but you never know what could happen. Okay. And it's just a good idea. Uh, and you know, you can be held liable. So make your products with the, the end consumer in mind. 
you know, build in those safety things. Uh, you know, think of all the the guards and things and the statements you have on all the tools in your shop. You're thinking, who would ever put their hand on this? Or who would, why yeah. would anybody ever do that? Somebody has somewhere. And that's why that guard is there. Okay. But that's why that statement's there. So just kind of think about that when you're, when you're designing stuff. What if somebody went to a place like LegalZoom.com and got a waiver and then had their buyer sign a waiver saying, you know, I'm not responsible if, if you hurt yourself while using my product. That will most likely work, but this is one of those situations where state law may trump general common law. Mm. Uh, typically, waivers are totally acceptable, and they are used uh, by all the big boys and most of their things. You know, Think of all the waivers you see on a daily basis, parking garages, concert tickets, all sorts of things. Whether they're enforceable or not depends on the state. So, for example, in California, a waiver would probably be just fine, uh, but it may not be, the, be that way in every state. Gotcha. So you'd want to look. Um, it certainly would be it certainly wouldn't be a bad thing, but at that point, you kind of think, oh, my, what are my customers going to think when I'm signing out? You know, what is this thing going to do to me? Yeah, yeah. Type of situation. But yeah, a waiver could absolutely be a way of dealing with it. All right. Um, this is one I'm kind of confused on myself. Uh, what's the difference between copyright and trademarks? If I start a business, what should I copyright and what should I trademark? All right. Well, the way to think about the difference between copyright and trademark is trademark is protecting your brand. It's protecting a company's name. It's protecting a you know a product type of, of action. A copyright is protecting your free expression, your your creative side of it. So a brand is not creative. You know, think of Lego. Lego is going to trademark their name, but they may copyright their design. Okay. So that's sort of the or patented even. So that's sort of the way to think about it. Trademark is mostly you know it's it's the trade. It's it's protecting the image of the company. It's protecting the company itself, the, the name of it. Copyright is more uh, you know protecting what you know, this this glass design may be copyrighted or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, that's the biggest difference. Okay. I had a um, I sell T-shirts that say make something, and uh, one of them has a saw blade on there, and it says make something. Now I never. Um, copyrighted mm -hmm. that design or trademark that that particular saying or whatever and i saw somebody steal that recently they they changed the graphics up a little bit they put it on a sweatshirt and they have it for sale on a on a on a website do i even though i never went through the process of the copyright or trademark do i own that probably you know in the intellectual property doctrine in the United States, yes, you do, because it, it, assuming you were the first person to have ever put that on a shirt. Mm -hmm. um, copyright in the United States is set up in a way such that you get copyright pretty much instantly in anything that you create or produce. It's The copyright process is a form of protect, protecting that copyright in your expression and making the world known that you have done this and that you've copyrighted mm -hmm. it. So in that situation, yeah, it probably wouldn't have been the best to copyright the design. But then you have a whole other issue of enforcing your copyright and you know, paying to enforce it. Uh, you know, if, if they would, let's say that they, you did copyright that design and they started making that shirt, you might be able to send them a letter and that might be all that it is and they stop selling it. Or they might just keep selling it and say, well, screw him. And if they do that, you got a decision to make. Are you going to enforce your copyright? Or are you yeah. going to just let it go? It's sort of the same thing with Google and, and, and Apple, right? I mean, they're all fighting over this oh, yeah. stuff. And they have to enforce it and go after them. Otherwise, they, the way the law is set up, they possibly could lose it. Cool. So, yeah. All right. Next question. There seems to be a lot of confusion about what's a hobby and what's a business. At what point do you officially need to start a business? And what are the proper steps? All right, this is a good question, and it all it's totally going to depend on each individual person because, you know, it, from the IRS's standpoint, anything, anytime you've sold something for, you know, outside of your immediate family or anytime you've sold something, you've moved past the hobby and into the business making. Mm. Um, but, you know, that may not always be the case, right, because you may just, uh, you may have a day job and you may just make pins on the side or you may make candlestick holders on the side and you sell them once a year at a craft show or something like that, that's probably still a hobby. Arguably, the IRS would disagree. But for, for most intents and purposes, it's a hobby. And that's all you're doing. It's not your main for source of income. It's not something that you're going to retire off of. Maybe, maybe not. Um, and uh, it's probably not necessary to incorporate or to form an LLC. But once you've made the decision that either you're going to uh, make this your full-time gig or you want to make it your full-time gig and you want to start getting into that type of situation, then it may be good to uh, form an LLC or depending on what your state requires. Each state has different 
uh, formation requirements. But typically, most states recognize an LLC, and I would recommend that for 90, probably 99% of your audience. I was going to say, one of my next questions was um, for a one-man shop, which is most of my viewers, um, which is the best way to go, LLC, incorporated, or sole proprietorship? Well, the difference in the sole proprietorship to an LLC is going to be uh, the liability protection. So uh, an LLC is a limited liability company. And the whole idea is that you are not operating as a person. A sole proprietor is an individual doing business in their own name. So if I was just sitting on the beach somewhere and drafting wills for 50 cents a pop, which sounds like an okay gig sometimes, <laughs> um, you, that would probably be a sole proprietor because I'm just I, I'm doing it in my name. There's no business behind me. It's just me. If I was sitting in an office building and had a firm and was you know, working that same way, that is more of a business entity, and that's an LLC or an LLP or an incorporate, you know, or incorporated entity. So if your business is, is low, your volume is low, everybody can be a sole proprietor without registering with the state typically. Hmm. You're just doing business as yourself. Some states and some cities have requirements to register your business. Um, you need to be cognizant of those, and those vary in every single jurisdiction. You kind of need to, to know. Sometimes you can just contact the Chamber of Commerce and find out what's needed at where I'm operating. But if you're a sole proprietor, that's, that's very simple. And any income you make, you would simply put on your tax return as other income. Hmm. If you hmm. go the extra step and say, okay, now I'm an LLC, then you've sort of you know, elevated yourself, the state, and assuming your state has income tax, um, your, the state and the, and the IRS are going to be looking for a tax return from your entity. They're going to assume that you have made some money or have lost some money that yeah. year. So you're going to have that kind of cost in mind. You can form, uh, and this is getting somewhat technical, but you can choose to operate as an S corporation. And then you would just file one tax return. You would, you would put all that income on your personal tax return. And that's all there would be. So you would just file one. And that would be the simplest thing. And probably, you know, 99.9% .9 of your audience, that would be totally the right way to go. And uh, the advantage to an LLC or a corporation, I, I wouldn't suggest most people, unless, you know, they've specifically spoken to an attorney and they've, for some reason, said this is, a corporation is the way to go. Um, an LLC provides that limited liability. So if somebody does get hurt, somebody does, um, you know, get damaged by your design or something happens, the only assets that they can ever get from you if they were to sue you and, and get a judgment is things owned by the LLC. Okay, I may have gotten some misinformation before because I, I believe I have an LLC myself. Okay. And I, I, I was told that if I get sued, even though if my business gets sued, they can still go into my personal bank accounts. No, that would be the reason you would have an LLC. Okay. The only time that that can happen, the only time they can personally come after you, your specific personal stuff, is if there's, for some reason, they've successfully argued that you were operating outside of your LLC and you were doing it in your individual okay. name. So, so long as you are always operating as the drunken woodworker, you enter into contracts as the drunken woodworker and signed by you, you know, comma, president or you, comma, uh, owner, whatever the case may be, that protects you. And that's okay. the idea of having an LLC. Because if, if officers or owners of companies could be held personally liable, uh, then there would be no reason to do an LLC. It's certainly not tax advantageous for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, so the LLC is what's designed to give you proper protections. And certainly, you know, we're obviously skimming the subject very lightly. So there are tons of, you know, requirements with the LLC, tons of requirements with a corporation. And you absolutely need to be in compliance with those to make sure that you keep your limited liability or you keep your protection of personal assets to, to business assets. Obviously, you know, do some more research on that yeah. for your audience. But, yeah. um, you know, that's the idea. So that's sort of the, you know, the thousand foot level uh, process. You would want to have some type of limited liability and that would be the LLC. Awesome. So to me, this one seems kind of obvious, but lots of people are asking about it. What about adding sports logos or just logos in general to your work? What yeah. can and can't be done? Well, sports logos are interesting because, you know, obviously everybody has a very, you know, proud connection to their team. We're sitting in Ohio right now, almost in Michigan. So, uh, you know, you have the Ohio State Buckeyes and Wolverines, and there's tons of handmade stuff that have the logos of the teams on there. You know, typically speaking, college teams do not police their um, intellectual property from handmade stuff extremely well. They aren't very, you know, they, don't, they don't go after individuals that do that. 
typically. But it is absolutely a violation of copyright to use it, as it is. If you just take your team's logo and you create it and you just put it in your, your item in the clock that you've made and you sell it, you're absolutely violating copyright on every level for the most part. And you could be held accountable and liable and all of that. Um, you're obviously you have some options. You could license it, which is going to be outrageously mm -hmm. expensive and probably very unlikely for most people's situation. Um, you could use some type of fair use doctrine to utilize it, and typically that's kind of hard with a logo because the logo is the logo, and that's why you're using it. Um, you know, but you could have do some type of uh, artistic expression of the logo, some type of recreation of it. Um, so if everyone wants to Google the quarterback, you know, the Ohio State Buckeyes uh, logo and kind of see what I'm thinking of, you know, you have the, the, the O and it's in a specific color. Well, if you took that and maybe you changed the way it was designed and you did some different coloring with it and you did some, some sort of unique expression, you're probably going to be okay. But then it's not the Ohio State Buckeyes logo. And then it doesn't appeal to the person you're trying to sell it to, yeah. right? So typically logos are really hard because the, if you're just selling it to your friends or you're making it for a family member, yeah, you're probably all right. But if you're going to start setting up at maker's fairs or you're going to start going to flea markets or, or wherever you're selling your item, selling it online, of course, it's going to get you popped almost immediately. Um, you're obviously got a problem. And typically the way it's going to be handled is you're going to get a reach out from one of their attorneys and they're going to say, hey, we see that you're utilizing our, uh, our IP. And they handle it one of two ways. I've seen it happen both ways and I've gotten both letters from clients. Uh, they're either going to say stop they're going to say, oh, yeah, thanks for using that. Here's the bill for our for our IP. And they and they do absolutely try to uh, go after that. Yeah. Um, you may your personal situation may make it very unlikely for them to do that, but you never know what they're going to do. And they've started to convert more to these letters demanding money for the licensing. Oh, yeah. And they essentially just say, OK, well, this is what we would pay. This is what we would charge anybody else to license it. Here's your bill for licensing it. Um, that's obviously not a letter you want to get because <laughs> now you're you're behind the eight ball, of course, and yeah. you're trying to scramble and you're freaking out and you're you're feeling like your hobby has now turned into a nightmare or your business has turned into a nightmare. So be really careful using logos. Um, the only way you can even consider really doing it above the board is to do something, you know, very radical or different, change it, you know, some type of fair use expression, you know, parody of it or something like that. But then you've kind of lost your, your reasoning for doing it using the logo, but I'm sure it can be done. And I've seen situations where, you know, two teams logos have been combined or, you know, somebody has made a new logo for the team. That stuff's okay. Mm -hmm. uh, typically won't cause you a problem, but just flat out copying the logo or copying a, a celebrity's face or something like that can get you into some trouble. So uh, let's say a scroll saw artist uh, takes a photo, somebody's copyrighted photo of Mick Jagger and creates woodwork out of that. Mm -hmm. Are they in violation? And who are they in violation with? Mick Jagger or the person that took that photograph? <laughs> Depends because, you know, typically, yes, the answer is yes, they would most likely be in violation if the person has a copyright to the photo, which they most likely do. Um, or they're, you know, they haven't given a, a free Creative Commons license or something like that. Because when somebody takes a photo, they have an instant copyright in the photo, um, regardless if they're using it for commercial gain or not. It's then up to that person to give a license of their photo. So if somebody takes a photo, let's say they see it in a, online, a Mick Jagger photo, to use your example, and then they take that photo and recreate it, that's arguably a violation of copyright because you have, re, you have, you have used it. Now, where you might be able to get away with it, and this is where you kind of have to talk to a lawyer and analyze your facts to what, what is happening because there's a lot of case law in this area and it's very complex. You might be able to get away with the fair use, you know, the, the fair use doctrine, which says, you know, hey, I've taken this item and, and created it. Uh, and made it something totally unique and something totally different. Sort of like a mashup of two songs, right? Where you take two songs and put them together or you do something like that. That typically gets you out of a copyright violation mm. when you've done something like that. So you just have to be careful. Um, now, if you take it from memory or something like that and, uh, you know, you've, you, or you do your own scene, you have a, you obviously you have created something that could be copyrighted if you're not taking it from something else. But then you have the other issue of using somebody's image. And that's, you know, that's probably the least likely thing to happen. Um, but, you know, Mick Jagger's, you know, Mick Jagger's uh, could, could go after you. I've seen uh, estates of individuals like Elvis Presley's estates, very known uh, for policing this type of thing. I think this happened with the uh, Barack Obama the, campaign. Yeah, I'm uh, sure that it did. 
Uh, yeah, I yeah. think I remember hearing that. And that's exactly it. I mean, because when you have a copyright in something, the only way you can arguably keep your copyright is if you police infringing acts. Mm. So that's why you see companies, even when they maybe don't want to, they have to go after copyright infringement because if they don't, then the argument can be made by somebody who they really don't want to infringe the copyright. They say, well, you're not even policing your copyright. You've lost it. Oh. And that's the whole idea. That the, the copyright system is somewhat self-policing, and then you use the courts to, you know, kind of bring it everything together. So I would say just be very careful with logos, individual images, uh, that kind of thing, or paintings, famous paintings, you could be careful. But if something's out of uh, copyright, uh, something's in the public domain, then it's good. And that all depends upon what type of item you're looking at, uh, whether, you know, like the Mona Lisa is probably out of, in the public domain, it's so old, the copyright's gone. Yeah. So things like that are typically okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and um, I just want to touch on, uh, there was a, a few comments about uh, using copyrighted music in your YouTube videos. And well, technically you can't put somebody else's copyrighted music in your videos, what YouTube will do is they will put ads up on your video and the copyright holder will make money from the, those ads. So uh, in my videos, I use all my own original music and there are tons of resources to get um, uh, open source or yeah, or, absolutely. And no, but you know the thing to think. I know everybody thinks, oh, I want this music to come in. If nobody's watching your your podcast to listen to the music, most likely, yeah. right? Because if that's the case, they're just going to pop on the video that has the music on it <laughs> and just listen to it. So you know, use your don't risk having uh, you know YouTube come down on you or banning your video. Mm -hmm. Or also, you know, um, you know, you want to be able to monetize your video at some point. Right. So use your own music or get music from. Creative Commons licensing or some type of open source so that you can you can benefit from it. Awesome. Well, thanks, Josh. You are very, very welcome. That was real good information. So Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, once again, on. why don't you tell them your website and, and your business? Sure. So I work for Primeth and Driscoll. I'm a partner there. You can go to my website, uh, www.primethlaw.com, P-R-I-M-U-T-H law.com. And if you're in Ohio or California, feel free to give me a call. I can uh, talk to you about your specific situation. All right, guys. That's it. Be safe, stay passionate, and make something. Cheers.